thank you so much for being here today. We're super excited to have you on the show. I would love if you could introduce yourself. Sure. My name is JV Hilliard, and I am an epic and dark fantasy writer and the author of the Warminster series, which is a four book series uh, set in a uh, an epic fantasy realm. Amazing. Could you tell us a little bit more about your books? Yeah, sure. So I started writing at a very young age and uh, do it professionally outside of my authorship. Uh, but dipping into fantasy and in fiction in general was uh, something that happened to me when uh, COVID hit. Uh, but the you know the you know, gave me a little bit of if there was a silver lining in anything, I, it gave me the time to you know put pen to paper and really you know draw out a a, a nice fantasy adventure series, which is really starting with the Last Keeper, which is book one in the Warminster series. Book two, Voridan's Lair, just came out uh, two Fridays ago, uh, and you know the books really focus on two sets of heroes. The the first is really a struggle, kind of uh, false prophet versus chosen one between Damus Alaric, who's the main character in the novels. And he's a young prophet that uh, is able to see and foretell of the coming of a fallen keeper, uh, someone that's a rival of his sect. Uh, And as that rival gets closer uh, to taking his revenge, the power of the keepers begins to wane. And it's his struggle uh, to maintain uh, the realm's uh, keepers uh, against this coming chaos. And, you, you know, the second set of characters are really uh, a set of, of folks that we've seen in, in other tropes, uh, but they work, so we use them. Uh, and uh, Sir Ritter of Vulcaneer um, is kind of a ranger character and is set in the uh, in the framework of an Aragorn uh, from Tolkien or a Dritz from the Dark Elf series. Uh, except he's born Trollborn. And Trollborn, it, for me, is a way of saying someone of mixed heritage. Uh, and so he's part Raven Elf and part human. Uh, and of course, this works against him. He's kind of my muggle, right? Uh, you know, if you're a Harry Potter fan. Um, and he falls in love with Princess Adeline Elspeth, who, who is with, he's she's a, Ver, a Vermilion Elf, which is the highest caste of elves. Uh, and they are forbidden from really, you know, consorting or, um, you know, any kind of fraternization with lesser forms uh, of themselves. And the two really have to challenge that social norm. Is he this low border knight that everybody looks down their nose at? Can he really love someone of a higher caste? And will she break her social mores to reach down to him to be with someone that she truly loves? And and so you, you get a little forbidden love, you get a little bit of of you know struggle and betrayal and all those kind of fun things wrapped into a really nice four book epic fantasy series. Amazing. What inspired you to write your books? Uh, So I'm a lifelong geek, right? I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for over 20 years. Uh, It started uh, when I was younger. Uh, I, my uncle was paralyzed in the war and my mother was his nurse and I grew up in his, at his bedside for the most part. Uh, And there are very limited things he could do. One of which was play Dungeons and Dragons. The other of which was write. Uh, So I learned to write at a young age. And of course I played tabletop role-playing games with him. Uh, and that was his form of escapism. And so I started playing with family. Uh, and then I started playing with friends as I got older. And some of those campaigns have been memorialized in one capacity or another in the Warminster series. Some of them are just names of characters that I've co-opted. Others are a bit of story arcs or plot arcs or even villains uh, that are part of it that were used as the big, big bad, evil guys in, in the in the D&D adventures. So, you know, for me, I was I was able to take you know, some of that alongside, I had a uh, a series of recurring nightmares when I was in late high school, early college years. Um, and I used that as a bit of fuel for the tension between Damus, the main character, and Great Taurus, the mad, the the villain. Um, and I kind of cast Great Taurus as the guy that came from my dreams in that. So it's that's a little weird and it's kind of hard to admit, but it's true. So, you know, uh, you asked the question, and that's really kind of where some of that came from. I love that. When you were writing your books, who are you thinking of when it comes to who your books are for? Sure. So first of all, I, I mean, they're for my friends and family. I dedicated the first book to both my wife and my uncle among a lot of friends that I've played Dungeons and Dragons with over the years because I knew that they would appreciate it. Uh, but generically, they're for folks that like every type of, of fantasy, whether it's epic, dark, classic, high fantasy, sword and sorcery, you know, any of those kind of things, because those are, that's really where, you know, I, I fell in love with, uh, you know, the, that genre. However, I've 
tucked into it a little bit of horror. I've tucked into it a little bit of sci-fi, uh, just enough that it's not going to upset the traditionalists that don't want to see sci-fi and fantasy and and things like that. But I think that I've created my own monsters. And so if you if you are a fan of unique worlds with unique magic systems with with mean unique uh you know cities and and races i think you'll find that all within the warminster series so fans of that genre uh as as well as i think um it's suited for people that i would say would be advanced young adult but it's really targeting new adult to age 80 plus really anybody in in, in that respect so amazing I know you touched on this briefly, but how long have you been writing and what made you really sit down and start to write your books? Yeah, I've I've been writing since the fourth grade. Um, you know, it's something I've loved to do. I took creative writing classes throughout high school and college and communication classes. Uh, and then my profession is, you know, I'm, I'm a DC lobbyist by day. So I do a lot of communicating, but it's, uh, it's nonfiction, uh, you know, and it's all built in a world of entire realism. Uh, so this is my escapism, right? This is my opportunity to, to take some of the stuff that I've seen in my professional life. Uh, and, you know, I have to say, you know, transitioning from something that's policy writing or legislative in nature, or even like speeches and trying to get into writing prose, writing dialogue, <laughs> uh, pacing the novels, you know, that's an entire different trick of the trade. I had to learn that through hiring a series of very qualified development and copy editors and having a very attentive publisher alongside a, a group of beta readers that tell me when my stuff stinks so I can go back to the drawing board to fix it before it goes to publication. <laughs> Amazing. What's your schedule like when you're writing a book? So I am the quintessential planner. I, I plot everything, right? So I, I am not, if you'd said to me, you know, Joe, uh, werewolves meet spaceships, go, I, I'm dead. Like I can't, I I am not a pantser. I can't sit here and start writing. And I have to know where the novel's going. Uh, so for me, I typically write in, in a reverse engineering. Like I start writing the book at the end and then I have a whiteboard in front of me that has a variety of plots and character arcs and things I don't want to forget and details that are important to me that are in the book. And as I write backwards, I erase them off the whiteboard as they go into the book in the way I want them in there. So for me, it's typically what I would describe as uber planning uh, for it. And, you know, I have a tendency to write something every day and whether that's just outlining the next thing or uh, whether it's, it's uh, you know, really two, two chapters, uh, that varies on energy levels and availability. But I always try to make writing muscle memory uh, and therefore I, I feel bad like when I miss going to the gym I feel bad about it you know and I want my writing to be the same way so I stay on pace and in this day and age I think you know as we get into like millennials and gen z and eventually gen alpha uh there's there's a need to do more rapid release of information you can't this the world of releasing a book every year doesn't cut it anymore there's a you know people like to binge read or binge watch tv and so um, there's a there's a demand aspect that's changed the marketplace a bit. So for me, I think that helps me pace it and stay on pace. Love that. What do you need in your writing space to help you stay focused? I need to have my dogs outside. <laughs> they they have a tendency to to act up. I'm surprised that they haven't yet, but I just fed them so they're One's crashed out on the couch, the other's lying next to my feet. So I'm good with that. Uh, but for me, you know, I can pretty much write anywhere. I've written on airplanes, I've written in hotel rooms, I read in coffee shops, and I write in, in my my home. So for me, it, it's not really where I am as much as uh, you know, when I try to get into the mood of writing, or if I've got an important scene I want to write, I typically listen to music. Music helps me get into the mood. And if you pick the right music and you know what you need for a big battle scene, or there's going to be a big romantic scene, there, there's certain, you know, you can't listen to Metallica and write romance, you know, in the same way you, you can't listen to, you know, uh, a love song and write a battle scene. So, you know, you, you've got to have the right, you know, bearings uh, when you're going into that. And I, and I try to try to adopt that as well. And then, you know, I often uh, will let, you know, friends and family read it and tell me what they think. And and if I'm missing something or I'm too close to it, I usually use that level of 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 critique to go back and, and write it a little bit better. Amazing. What is your favorite writing snack or drink? 
Oh, that's simple. So I drink flavored water all day long because I get my, as one of my friends said, I get my fizzy, uh, you know, and so that helps me and it's it's healthier than drinking things that I shouldn't drink. But in the morning, I always have a cup of iced tea. Love that. What books do you enjoy reading personally? So, you know, this isn't going to shock you. I'm a big reader of fantasy and sci-fi, but my favorite genre of all is horror, in particular, gothic horror. So, you know, the Camillas of the world, the Draculas of the world, the Mary Shelley's with Frankenstein, uh, anything that that takes you back to that sort of gothic or Victorian era, uh, spring Jack, uh, anything related to, uh, you know, the mysteries and cryptid and cryptozoology is is a you know just a lot of fun and it gives me ideas for um the monsters of the realm uh i pick things out of you know traditional and real life history and morph them into something that has uh a mysticism to it and and drop it into the book so one of my bad guys is the antlered man you know and that's sort of a you know a, a mix between a norse myth and biblical myth you know when it when it comes to some of that stuff and or um, you know, I have, uh, you know, these, these things I call cryptids. Um, there's, there's this skin stealer, which is basically like a doppelganger of sorts, or like a, a true skin stealer that what that comes from native American lore. So I, I try to use those things in my writing and, and I, and I try to use that to spark my creativity. Love that. What type of books did you grow up reading? Did you have a favorite? Oh, sure. Right. So like, I think in like that, Elementary school, middle school, it was Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, which really got me addicted to uh, fantasy adventure. Uh, and then middle school to high school, I, I fell in love with uh, R.A. Salvatore and the Dark Elf trilogy. Uh, real big fan of Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman's work, whether it's um, you know the uh, you know the, the Dragonlance series or even some of the other Dungeons and Dragons oriented stuff like Ravenloft. Um, I love. Uh, the God, every every October I reread Dracula uh, as, as my favorite of, of of all time. But I think that's what I read when I was younger, and and uh, I you know from a sci fi perspective, big fan of Asimov, big fan of Simon Hawk, who who wrote the Time Wars series, uh, and I try to reflect that in my writing. Amazing. On the opposite side of that, now as an adult, do you have a favorite series or author? Yeah, so Salvatore is still my favorite author. Weiss and Hickman running right behind them, but I am a fan of the Aragon series uh, by Paolini. I'm, I'm also a big Brandon Sanderson fan. I do like Neil Gaiman's stuff with American Gods and Sandman. Uh, I've just started to read Sarah Moss and the things that she has and Robin Hobb. Uh, so, you know, things that, that I think fall right into uh, my... Uh, my genre, but I'm also a big vampire nut. So I read like Twilight and I'll watch Buffy over and over again, or, or uh, even watch Vampire Academy. It's sad, but it's true. I, I try to write it off for like future research for my great American vampire novel. Uh, but in the, in the end, I just, anything vampire, I'll just consume no matter how hokey. Love that. <laughs> what would you tell someone just starting out with reading again? So, you know, I, I think I used the term muscle memory earlier. You know, I think that folks that are uh, just starting to read, uh, whether they're doing it through, you know, picking up a book and reading it, or they have their Kindle, or in some cases, you know, I think the fat one of the fastest growing marketplaces within publishing is audiobooks. I find myself using that as a tool when I do my travel, uh, and folks are in different places in their lives. You know, they've got kids, they've got families got to take care of sometimes they're older or or you've got jobs and so you might not be able to sit down in front of a fire and grab a cup of coffee and pop open a book but you can listen you know so for me you know i try to do it you know i when i try to write i i you know i want that to be muscle memory same thing with reading like for me you know go and pick up a new book once every other week or once a week you know and check it out at your library check it out at your local bookstore you know your 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 local you know take a book leave a book uh, you know, kind of thing. And, 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 and I also challenge myself. I have a friend who, who once said that she goes to things she doesn't like just to check them out. Uh, and she said, Oh, I find this event completely disinteresting. I'm going to go. And that's how she learns. She forces herself in a situation. And I think the same thing with, with reading is if you, if you make it a habit, 
I think that's good for you. It, I think it expands your mind. It gives you some escapism from probably what is a, a, a very real day. So true. What would you tell someone just starting to write their own book? So a few things. Uh, don't be afraid of constructive criticism. Uh, it, you know, I, everybody's afraid, especially with book one or novella one or poem one, uh, to share it with somebody. That's a, It makes you vulnerable. And people get to, to not only critique what you're writing about, but they get to critique how you're writing it. Um, but that's how you get better. Uh, and it's okay to have someone say, I really don't like this. Uh, or you should write it this way, or this might be better if, and if you really listen to them and they're offering you truly constructive criticism, as opposed to just saying, oh, I don't like, I don't like the genre, so I'm not going to read it. Well, then that doesn't matter. Like their opinion, you can, you know, kind of forget, but it's those that are, that are there that say, well, I don't get this, or you missed that, or explain this. And those points of you know, constructive criticism, you can use to go back and fix things before you go to publication. And I think that's, that, that's step one. Uh, step two is um, get yourself a group of beta readers. And for those of you who may not know what a beta reader is, uh, it's folks that are going to read your stuff before you go to publication that you trust their opinion. And I find that that also helps me break writer's block. Um, so if I go to somebody that's a fellow creative, whether they're an artist or a poet or an author, or a filmmaker, and they say, hey, you know, I, I like this, but what about this? And they throw an idea at you. You may find that their idea is better or something you can write around or develop some storyline around. Uh, and so don't be afraid to do that and share because, you know, once you develop that thick skin, it really doesn't matter when someone criticizes your book because you, you'll go on to the next and you hopefully you can learn something from it. I'll, and I'll give you a perfect example of that. I had a, uh, a two-star review one time. On uh, like Goodreads or Amazon or whatever. And the woman who wrote it said, uh, I really wanted to like this book. Uh, I bought it for its cover and uh, I got into it, but I couldn't get past page 50, did not finish two stars. And for the first five seconds, I was de devastated. And then in second six, I said, hey, the book did its job or the cover did its job. It sold based on its cover. So I, I took that piece and said, that was the good the bad was, hey, you know what? Sometimes my books aren't for everybody. If you don't read epic fantasy or you don't like multi-point of view reads, sometimes that's hard and that's okay. You don't have to sell to everyone. You just have to sell to the folks that like your stuff. So true. What's one thing that people are generally surprised to find out about you? Uh, so there's a lot of things that I think that people are generally surprised uh, to find out about me. But I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the one thing is, um, you know, I've taken the work that I've done in real life and placed it inside my novels. And in the realm of Warminster, there's a, a city of Abacus, which is a scholar city, and it's a city of development. I mentioned a little earlier about how I, I, I kind of sprinkle in a little sci-fi uh, into my novels. Well, you know, fantasy doesn't typically in fantasy, what you'll find is, um, you know, like Jon Snow, he's the literally the 999th, you know, leader of the black of the guard on the wall or, and they're still using swords and shields or, you know, they're still horse and buggies. Uh, and there's no true technological advancement. Well, in, in my world, I work with all tech companies, most of which do work with the Pentagon. And so I'll see, technologies that they use that provide for the common defense or promote the general welfare. And I'm able to use some of those ideas, spin them into something that looks very medieval, that looks very fantasy oriented, but has just a tinge of sci-fi for my sci-fi readers and gives them that little faith that, hey, you know, this there, there's something here that's going to pop and there's going to be advancements in, in this, you know, fantasy medieval society. And so, you know, I, I think people look at me strange when I say I'm a DC lobbyist because I, you know, I don't know how many other DC lobbyists write fantasy adventure. I'm going to guess this many, uh, but you know, it's true, and it's and it really helps me develop plots and, and different angles for it. That's amazing. Is there anything you would like to say or add? Yeah. So for those that are writers out there. Keep writing. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier, if you make something muscle memory, you'll continue to do it. And don't be afraid to share. Uh, for those that are readers, hey, uh, you know, like there are going to be books out there that you hear about that uh, everybody says is great. You read them and you don't like them. Uh, but keep reading anyway. 
uh, or find something that you do like or find an author or a series of authors that you do like or series of books, you know, and keep reading those. And I would encourage readers, the lifeblood of what we do is reviews. You know, I teased about a two-star review before, but nothing makes you feel better than, than getting a, a review on, on you know, Apple Books or, or somewhere or when you're, you're, you know, you're not expecting it and someone puts you in a blog and tells you how much they like your book and they're waiting for the next one. That is like the rocket fuel. You know, that gives you, it's like, yes, I'm doing something right. Somebody likes it and that makes me go and, and do more of it. So I would encourage write, readers to leave those reviews because they really, really, really help the authors. Amazing. I love that. Where's the best place for readers to find your book? I know a lot of readers love signed copies. Is that an option and the best place to connect with you? Yeah, sure. So yeah, if they want a signed copy, it's pretty easy. They can go to my website and leave me a message and that's jvhilliard.com. And I'd be happy to send out a a book with with a signed copy to them. Uh, If they like, uh, if they buy, they can buy it in a variety of different capacities. They can find uh, my books on everything from Amazon to Kobo, Rakuten, Apple Books, Barnes and Noble. It's it's almost ubiquitous uh, in places where it can be. If you want to go to my publisher and, and support a small house publishing company, you can buy it directly from dragonmoonpress.com. Uh, and you can find me there. And then my audio books are on Audible and a variety of other uh, audio services like Scribed and, and Apple Books and such like that. Social media is pretty easy to find me at I'm at JV Hilliard Books on TikTok, Amazon, or excuse me, TikTok, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. And then Facebook, I am just JV Hilliard. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. And we'll be sure to drop those links in the show notes so that everyone can find them. And again, thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the time. 